All right, how's it going? My name is Matt and you're listening to the Looking Sideways Action Sports Podcast, the show where I try and uncover the most interesting stories in action sports and other related endeavours. Thanks for tuning into this episode. I hope you enjoy it. If it's your first time listening to the show, let's get a bit of the uh, admin out of the way first. You can find full show notes to this episode and the entire back catalogue over at my website, www.wearelookingsideways.com. And you can find me at We Look Sideways on Instagram, which is probably the social network I'm most active on anyway, right? So my guest this week is yet another copper-bottomed cast iron legend of their chosen field. That is a metaphor, obviously. The great Tora Bright. Tora has been at the top of a game in snowboarding for the last 20 years, which is mad, really. I mean, I remember, as we discussed, seeing her 20 years ago in the French Alps. God, that went quick. Anyway, you know, when you look back at her career, the headline news is obviously that 2010 Olympic gold medal in Vancouver, but that is just one highlight in a career that has come to symbolise everything that is creative and expressive about snowboarding. And it's this, if you ask me, that does make her one of the true greats. Because to achieve greatness in the competitive arena, as Tora did, is one thing. To do so in a way that also pushes the sport forward and communicates the sheer joy of snowboarding is another thing entirely. And it's not that common certainly not as common as you might think, which is why we tend to venerate those snowboarders that pull it off so highly. I'm thinking of Terrier in his 90s pomp, Danny Davis, Anna Gasser, Castellet at the minute. I'm sure there are more. There's a common thread in there as well, which we'll get to. But my point is that this has been the one constant theme in Tora's career since her days as a frother, as she puts it, during her first winters in Whistler, all the way up to the present day and recent projects such as Outbounds. And now, as she prepares to become a mum for the first time, Tora is about to move into the next phase. And it seemed a very fitting time to sit down and cast an eye over her career. So far, we'll also find out her plans for the future. There's a lot to unpick in this one as we explored themes which are right up my boulevard. As you'll know, if you're at all familiar with the podcast, Tora is ace, somebody with a true generosity of spirit, a unique perspective, and she was really happy to explore some of the pretty personal themes we went into in this one, opening up fully and bringing the full range of her experience, insight, and uh, self-awareness to bear on our conversation. Yep, you're right, I enjoyed it. So I'll be back at the end for the usual housekeeping corner, but in the meantime, it's me and Tora Bright awakening. Enjoy. What tea have you got? Uh, I've got a raspberry leaf tea. Apparently, you know, 20 or 35 weeks pregnant. So raspberry leaf tea. I drink five teas a day. And uh, five dates a day, and apparently that's going to get my uterus and everything ready to give birth here soon. <laughs> wow, that's that's the thing, is it? That's, yep, that's, literally. Right. <laughs> okay. So that, is it, how, how are you feeling? Is it feeling it's working? Oh, well, you know, in five weeks' time, hopefully it all just is a breeze. <laughs> yeah. Wow, five weeks. So how are you feeling? Come on, quick. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. Like, physically... Um, since I since I stopped traveling <laughs> and got home, rested, got my iron levels up, you know, I feel really good. I'm like, whoa, I really like pregnancy. It's been great. Um, but while I was still traveling and snowboarding, it was definitely a little challenging. <laughs> um, but yeah, now I'm just resting and preparing the body and mind for the, you know, big game day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Big event yeah. day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> coming, things are, coming things up. are good. <laughs> so... How long did you keep snowboarding until? Um, I was snowboarding until about 23 weeks. Okay. So, yeah. And it was, um, I felt, I felt good to be honest. I was in, I was in France my last trip and, um, I was, uh, you'd know Vernon Dick. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. No, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we were yeah, doing legend. a, yeah. yeah, love Vernon. We were doing a Roxy, um, campaign shoot. And, uh, you know, we were, we were on the full hustle. We didn't have great conditions, but we were, we were hustling and making it, you know, the best we could. And, and I got to one point during one of the days and I was like, Hey Vernon, I can totally like, I want to keep snowboarding. I want to get power turns, but I'm like, you're going to have to boot pack that so I can get up there. 
<laughs> so Vernon, Vernon set the boot pack so I could get up and do a few more turns. <laughs> that That's great. That's like, uh, that's, that's the kind of privilege. Man. That's the privilege you want though, isn't it? To pull that <laughs> yeah. card, you know. If you can, yeah, I'm if like, hey, a woman with baby on board. <laughs> <laughs> if, there, if there's ever a time to pull that card i'd say there you go yeah so, thank you thank you uh, and where were, <laughs> where were you in france um his pregnancy brain i was just there in february where was i <laughs> i literally can't think of the name i saw the same <laughs> just france just france um yeah Oh my gosh! Now I'm like Fran- got hot sweats because I literally can't think of where. I was. Let, let, let's just call it. Let, let's just call it Fransfordshire. That's what some of my friends there, call it. There like, we go. And they, uh, <laughs> to wind the locals up, it was like, yeah, we're going back to Fransfordshire. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, I was there. Uh, I was there, and that was actually my last trip in beginning of March. It was, and I certainly don't want to turn this into a coronavirus conversation, so I'll do my best not to. But um. Yeah, we were there beginning of March. I went to Maribel to see some old friends. Just did a a jolly, really, you know. Yeah. Just actually, just just actually, just went snowboarding with some friends, which is amazing. The best. And um, yeah, it was funny how quickly it it changed. It went from we, you know, we did flew from London, and at the airport, it was like classic British airport scenes, like eight in the morning, everyone drinking beers, like everyone kind of joking about coronavirus <laughs> doing the elbow thing and all that yeah yeah. and then by the time we got back four days later i think a week later we were, we were in lockdown so i felt pretty pretty lucky to have that last trip in the end didn't, yeah didn't really... you got it out of your system before it all went went down yeah so your last instagram post was i mean your instagram has been really lovely to follow actually as you've been you know exploring how you feel during the pregnancy and the last the last post was it it really sounded like you've been almost like surprised by how your relationship to your own body's changed. Yeah. Well, like, I think a lot of the talk you hear during pregnancy is like how hard it is. And mind you, it is really, really hard <laughs> at the beginning. Um, up until maybe 18 weeks, I was so sick and, you know, some days were better than others. The beginning, like you just, no one ever really talks about the toll that it like really does take on your your whole body and mind like I had days where I was like my body like I couldn't get out of bed I couldn't think I couldn't you know and sometimes I felt depressed and um and the more I open up and share with other people they're like that's how I felt like so it's like you the beginning stages of pregnancy where you're literally like from cells then creating this little human like it takes so much out of you and um, and I'd never really heard anyone talk about that. So I was like, what's happening to me? This is weird. Like, <laughs> right. um, but then, yeah, as things like went on, you just kind of you, you're easier on yourself in a way, like because, you know, my body, it's allowed me to do so much. And I've been so demanding of it over the years um, that it was really just learning to listen and respect it in a different kind of way, because the more you take from your body, the less that little human has to, you know, nourishment to actually do its thing and grow properly. So there was like a, it, it was an interesting time to balance it um, between like, okay, well, I'm still, I want to be snowboarding. I still want to be traveling and doing what I'm doing. Cause I don't have this big belly stopping me, <laughs> but yeah. like, whoa, I've got like, I've really got to let this little person like take everything it needs from me. So like, you know, some days I just, I just had to give in because I'd pushed it days before and, you know, I was tired. So I just stayed in bed <laughs> and that- I didn't feel bad about it. And now I'm like, you know, I wish so much that I, my belly would pop at the beginning. I'm like, I wanted something to show, you know, you just look thick and kind of a bit chubby for a while. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, and yeah. now I've got this huge belly and I'm like, I've never been so like, um, I, yeah, I've never loved my body so much. It's like, it's insane. It's like, I just feel like this, I don't know, beautiful feminine body, you know, that's just creating life, creating and sustaining life. It's crazy. <laughs> was was that shift that you're talking about to, to slow down and, you know, to, to treat your body in a different way? Was that, was that a difficult transition or did you find it came quite naturally? Um, I think because of injuries in the past, like especially concussion, um, 
I'd kind of dabbled in that um, because, you know, it was just, it was invisible, you know, much like the, the first couple months of pregnancy, it's pretty invisible. Yeah. Um, but you know, something's going on. Um, so I did kind of had, have a good experience in, and, and learning to just surrender and listening to the body. So it wasn't as harsh for me. Um, yeah. That I was just like, okay, you know, my body's doing something amazing right now. I'm just going to let it do its thing and it will, you know, it will, it will take charge and I'll be able to, you know, function at some point. <laughs> But I think, um, too, I think when you hear everybody talk about pregnancy, it's like everybody wants to get back to where they were before. And I think, you know, I can love my body all I want now, but I really hope that I can keep that that kind of mental game post-baby too and just, like, really honour what it is that the body's still doing and recovering from, like, post-birth. So, you know, of course, everybody wants to feel feel good and look good, but... I'm like, no, I'm like determined to keep like this good, um, good mind body image, like in intact, like post birth and just do what feels good. You know, your biggest priority is just nourishing this little baby from here on out. So, um, we'll see. Well, you'll, you'll have to ask me then, you know, after the baby, what I, <laughs> how my body <Yeah>. image is. <laughs> Well, it's it's an interesting question, though, isn't it? Because for women, it's 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 ob- and it's a really obvious thing to say, but it, it just is different, isn't it? You know, the expectations that are on women when you become a parent and and men are very very different, especially when you're a professional athlete like you are, and your relationship to your body and your ability to to use your body is what's given you the career that you've enjoyed. Um, So it is a really interesting question, isn't it? Because even, you know, I I run a business with a really close friend of mine who's just had two kids and even seeing her, I'm not going to say struggle because struggle is the wrong word, but just like the the fact that she has to balance each of these things, you know, like the perception of herself as a mom, a new mom, but also the perception of herself that she has as as the old woman that she was and the, the fact that she had this successful career and try to balance those two things. It is clearly challenging you know, for pe- for women, especially, like I say, when, yeah, obviously men have to make some changes in their life, but it isn't the same. I think that's pretty, pretty clear to see, isn't it? So it is a really interesting question, especially, like I say, for for you as, a, as an athlete. So have you given that much thought in that context about how, how it might change things or how you might try and mitigate that a little bit? Yeah, well, to be honest, I just like, I pretty much listen and talk to women who have done it you know come back to work in different fields and just like listen with ears wide open because I just think that I don't I don't want to have any of these preconceived ideas that I am going to do this or I am or I won't do that or even like with you know sleep training or breastfeeding or you know everyone's like how long are you gonna breastfeed and I'm like well I don't know like as long as I can, you know, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's the same thing, like, you know, getting back to physical shape and, you know, work and whatnot. Um, I, I think I don't want to have preconceived ideas to be disappointed in myself or to, you know, <laughs> not meet yeah. those markers because I think it's like uh, the hardest thing in this world in, in a few ways is just like, learning to be kind to yourself and letting it just, you know, we're just, we're just humans. We're doing our best, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so it's, yeah, it really is finding that, you know, balance or, or your flow with this new, new life and working it in. Um, and obviously, you know, um, it's not going to be, I, I just say like, you know, getting back to snowboarding and, you know, Northern winter and whatnot. I'm like, well, it's just going to take a little bit more planning <laughs> and a little bit more help. <laughs> but, you know, that being said, I haven't done it before. And, um, it, yeah, it's just it's going to be what it'll be, you know, and you, you don't know what you're able to uh, kind of do until you till you're in it and you learn what, you know, you are and aren't able to do. So um, I'm just keeping a pretty open mind and um, just – to be honest, my whole life, I've loved talking to women 
um, you know, at any age, at whatever, you know, stage of life they're in, whether they've just had babies or, you know, teenage kids or whatever. It's always like a fascinating part of life that I've loved to just kind of be in conversation about. So um, it's right. pretty interesting that I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually in that stage of life now where I'm uh, starting a family and, and the real juggle starts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely. It's like you say, these rites of passage, whatever they are, if you're not careful, they do become another yardstick by which you, you try and, or you can't help but measure yourself against other people. Yeah. You know, like wh- wh- whatever it is, whether it's starting a family, like career, it's a really interesting point that you say about making sure that you don't do that. You know, you don't, you don't let these things be be another battleground for that, really, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> Because if you're not careful, there's, in, there's enough of that out there, isn't there? Without... T- totally. Totally. Like, and you know, I'm like, I'm just, I started reading a book actually called The Fourth Trimester. And I, and I, you know, it's about post-birth and everything to come of it. I had to put it down. I was like, this is too overwhelming. <laughs> you know, right. I'm like, let's just, you know, get through, you know, childbirth. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I can, you know, go in and focus on that. So I think it's yeah. like just really like not being prepared for what's ahead and knowing, you know, the possible challenges, but somebody else's experience necessarily isn't going to be what you are going to experience, whether it's, you know, good or bad or yeah. all of it. <laughs> have have so. you always been able to, to do that, to take that perspective where you could be, um, you know, be, where you said it be kind, where you could, you can, you can give yourself a day off. Or is that something that's evolved over the years? Definitely evolved. Um, <laughs> and I think it's been, um, yeah, it's been, it's been forced on me because it, it wasn't until, uh, like I, I, you know, like everybody who's weekend warrior or, you know, no matter how much time you spend doing your chosen sport, you it's inevitable. You're going to get some type of injury, but I feel like I was pretty pretty lucky to be honest with like the injuries I did have lots of bumps and bruises um a shoulder I had like wear and tear on that I ended up having um shoulder reconstruction of and then you know rehab's intense for anything like that you know five six months and um but it it really wasn't until the head injuries that like I had to learn how to just accept that that's where my body was and learn to understand my body and and care enough not to push through it because, well, I couldn't push through it. <laughs> that was, that was yeah. the bottom line. I couldn't. Um, and um, whereas every other injury, you know, there's this timeline and you're like, okay, we've, we've put you back together. By this point, you're going to be doing this, 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 you know, and sometimes it's delayed and sometimes it's not. But like head injury was just out of this world for me. Um, and so it was really it was really going through that multiple times that it took me right. to understand and learn that like to breathe and chill out and you can't push sure. through because you're sacrificing everything that matters in your life which is health is wealth health is everything you know yeah so yeah that's that's really where I learned those lessons <laughs> so how how long were those incidents what was the period you said plural Um, had injuries yeah so um i first hit my head just before the 2010 olympics and so i was coming into that winter like into that olympics not not riding i wasn't on snow um for probably i don't know over two weeks before heading off to vancouver and i i had like a knockout um training and it was just a mellow knockout um and uh oh no when was that yeah I think it was (laughs) sorry it was like early early January and I had two weeks off and I felt good I met all the benchmarks and balance was good and whatnot and then um I really wanted to compete in X Games before the Olympics and so I went to Aspen and I wasn't I, I just I don't think I was quite right anyway hit my head again apparently you know Freddie um, Osterbu, he he came to me in the bottom of the pipe after I hit my head, and apparently I was talking gibberish and went down the bottom. Wow. And anyway, there's like a an hour of time where I can't, I don't remember what happened. Um, 
But right. I just woke up in the um, uh, the medical center, like, in tears. I was just, like, I was on the side of the bed, like, just as I got up and I was in tears and they're like, oh, we got you up too quick. Like, we're going to put you back down. <laughs> and then I remember Benny there and he's just like, what's going on? And they're just like, don't worry, it happens just when you get them up too quickly. Like, and so I remember everything after that. And that was kind of like the first, the start of the head injuries for me. Um, right. And so after X Games, I just went home, I rested, um, and I was like, oh, this is really inconvenient considering um, <laughs> the Olympics are Olymp- uh, just, The Olympics you know? is around the corner, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, you know, at that time I hadn't dealt with it before. I hadn't, I guess it was a relatively unknown type of injury to really advise on and I was doing what I was being told to do at that time which was just rest dark rooms um and then uh my mom has always been into kind of what do you call it you know alternative therapies but you know they've been around for centuries (laughs) kind of thing yeah yeah alternative Um, healing Yeah. yeah so um I was doing like energetic work but also cranial sacral and osteopathy and things like that um and so before I went off to Vancouver, I was pretty good. Um, but I was also doing like a lot of visualization and this, like, I actually, I actually put a lot of, um, my success in the, the mental state I was in going into Vancouver Olympics to this time visualizing, um, cause I couldn't do anything. So I was like, right. okay, you know, I'm just gonna, um, work on this then I'm gonna, I'm gonna see myself. I'm going to feel what it feels like to be called up on the podium in first place. Um, (laughs) You know, I'm, it was almost like I, I was creating what I wanted to feel in the future. Um, And so I saw, I saw everything in color. I saw my name, you know, being called up a tour of ride from Australia, you know? Right. Um, So I spent my time doing that because I really couldn't do anything else. And so when we flew off to Vancouver, um, we went off, um, just not knowing whether I'd even compete. Um, I got to the Olympic village and got MRIs and got, you know, the whole, the whole checkout and, um, and I was cleared to compete. So I was like, okay, well, I know this happened before, you know, and that's why I'm here. If I don't feel right, I'm just not going to compete. Um, and so Benny and I, we went up to like the local resorts out of Vancouver, Grouse and, um, I think it was just Grouse and we got, riding just to make sure you know everything's right (laughs) and then I got um yeah and then I um started training in the half pipe um and just took it super super easy you know everything seemed okay I felt okay I still had headaches at the time I was having one of my um body workers kind of sneak into the house we were staying in because I wasn't allowed anybody else to treat me during the Olympics other than the team but I was like well this guy's really helping me, so I'm going to sneak him in. <laughs> right. So Dr. Bueller <laughs> from Kaysville, Utah. Thank you. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's um, that was kind of like my first um, head injury experience. And I uh, obviously, you know, I made it through the Vancouver Games and got what I wanted out of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, just, just a bit. Just a little bit. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was interesting. That was um, uh, an interesting lead up, and then to uh, to just be in that mental state where I was, uh, I guess, <sighs> calm enough to let the muscle memory take over. You know, in those yeah. weeks before the Olympics, it was it was definitely. Um, it's not like I was going to learn anything new, right? It's just yeah. really being prepared. And that's at that time, that was the only way I could be prepared was to learn the art of visualization and manifestation, I guess. <laughs> that, that, that's such an interesting story because it's because obviously that's the technique that's, you know, most people will have heard of. But it sounds like you've never really like visualization. I mean, you know, it's like you, you, you hear athletes talk about it a lot, but you'd never presumably really um, used it as a, as a technique before then. Not oh well. It's fascinating because I I had used it, um, just not as intensely as that. Um, yeah. But I remember my mom um, 
when we were young kids and in inter schools. I'm not sure if you guys have like in like schools ski and swim events and whatnot. But yeah, I think I think the culture where where you grew up is obviously quite a lot stronger. But yeah, we yeah. do we do have <laughs> yeah. we do have we do have a similar yeah we, you know we yeah. do have that we do have that path yeah so it was my mom like pretty much teaching me the same thing when I was just a kid um to to visualize to see what you wanted to happen so I remember even you know I was still in primary school and um and kind of learning how to do that basically you know I don't know how much time I spent doing it but I do remember it was something mom like taught us as kids um and I guess like all the way through my snowboarding career, um, you know, I had a little journal that I'd, you know, travel with. And I'd, I I remember drawing like a half pipe in it and like right. how, uh, putting my tricks, you know, my line through the half pipe and, you know, what trick combos I was going to do. And so in one way or another, I definitely, um, yeah, visualized or you know I think there's power in writing your goals down as well um right. so I, I did you know forms of it light-heartedly I guess but it wasn't until that Vancouver experience that I was just like okay this is what I gotta do <laughs> yeah yeah that's so how how did it I mean it's a decade isn't it which is wild like how a how, decade ago yeah so how <laughs> did you at the time did you appreciate the significance of that you know what like in the aftermath of that of that victory did you did you think wow there we go that was what really contributed to that or was that something that came as you reflected on it with more experience I think it took me a little bit of time to reflect um in that way because it was it was really such a relief to really <laughs> yeah it's so common that isn't it it's like to to when people achieve goals like that there's such a common, you know, I've been looking up to interview a lot of people doing this and that's a really common word that comes up a lot. Yeah. You know. <laughs> it was like, whew, okay. <laughs> I, I, I did it. I delivered, <laughs> yeah. I delivered what, I like, I wanted, you know, what I knew I was capable of, um, what my country wanted. And that was the funny balance, like... Um, Cause you were the flag bearer, weren't you? Yeah, well. and I was the flag bearer. And to be honest, I really think like all of it played part in it because to be given that honor, like still, it's like, ugh, it's like, ugh, gives me goosebumps. Like I, I absolutely was blown away that they even asked me. Um, but it's exactly what I needed um, to to just feel the support from you know our federation um, and and to like just build on that from the very beginning to then go into my event um so yeah I was like that that was a huge part of it all for me <laughs> yeah. being a flag bearer um but yeah the I think for Australia too you know they they only really care about winter sports once every four years as a national kind of thing you know yeah. our winter's so it's... so short but um but yeah Similar after to the UK yeah 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 probably very similar yeah so um yeah after 2006 you know I was like I am I'm just gonna leave no stone unturned I'm you know no doubt I'm gonna (laughs) you know be the best by far (laughs) so I worked so so hard and then to be in Vancouver and just like yeah the the relief I felt was insane that you know, my country was happy. <laughs> I wasn't going to get shat on. <laughs> right. um, and, and the, yeah, like, you know, everyone in the industry knew that I was, I was good enough at that time to win. So it was just kind of like, yes. <laughs> so were you, were you worried then by that, by the sounds of it? Were you, was it a concern that you might not fulfill that potential that you kind of thought you had? Um, Maybe it wasn't like a, a conscious like concern but for sure it was somewhere in there you know and um Benny um my brother who's my coach through all those years um he was so good at just instilling belief in me 
um, and had been ever since we were we first started working together. And who knows, maybe it was from the beginning, you know, we were always pretty good friends as, as young kids and when we first started snowboarding it was um it was he that started and I just wanted to follow (laughs) um but yeah from the very beginning he was like incredible at just instilling um belief in me and sometimes I believe that I had to borrow his belief um to actually you know do some of the tricks or you know take the time I needed to to build um you know on the on the bag of tricks that we wanted to to make sure that we were competitive um so it was yeah. yeah pretty interesting relationship really like I remember in Vancouver like Benny just comes out with these one-liners sometimes he's just kind of like whoa because he um <laughs> <laughs> um what was it he said I hope I can remember it um but I fell in the finals I fell um in my first run and so um, I think they, because of that, I scored the least. So they do the reverse um, score. Yeah. So then I went first. You, yeah. You get, your, you get your first one free, don't you? No. Yeah, you get your first one free. But because they reverse yeah. the order of the scores, like there was actually no one who went between my first run of the um, of the finals and uh, then right. the second. And then you had to go, and then yeah, you had so to then go I first. had to go straight back up. Yeah, and right. Just that's do a little. That's, that's a little sort of strange idiosyncrasy (laughs) that judging setup isn't it yeah yeah um but I remember like you know I was walking in and you know some people were just like oh you got this but like this really like kind of wide-eyed look at me just like kind of stressed like (laughs) right and Benny had it too Benny was really worried but he's like he said to me he's like I have supreme confidence in your ability just go and you know do it whatever it was and he gave me, you know, fist and, and there it was like, so wow, just that's like, brilliant. the one liner, man. <laughs> yeah. Just what knew, knew what you needed. Yeah. 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 I mean, I really wanted to ask you about Benny because he's such a, he's such an influence, not just on you, you know, obviously with everybody that he's worked with, he is, he's a definite unsung hero really of, of snowboarding, I think, because his stamp is he's really across a lot of modern snowboarding and i and obviously you, as you mentioned and you've already revealed a little bit of, of of how that's affected you it sounds like he's had this kind of vision and you know belief since you were quite young then really yeah i think so um i mean he from the minute we I don't know, got our eyes on snowboarding. He just, he lived it and breathed it. Um, you know, TB7 North of Heaven was probably, <laughs> it probably got played out and ruined, you know, in the first couple right. of weeks. He just, you know, from, he just loved it. And then, because uh, I don't think we started working together until like 2005. Um, okay. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't necessarily, he just kind of like, he saw he could help me and right. saw, um, uh, you know, I don't think he necessarily wanted to do that as, as a career choice. It just kind of, it just kind of stumbled, you know, in on it. Right. Um, and then uh, he, uh, yeah, over the years, like he's helped, you know, Danny Davis, Mark McMorris, he's coaching, um, uh Carol Castellet right now, who's like, you know, coming into her, you know, best competition years. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think he, he is quite like a, a, a visionary in a sense um, for. Well, it's, it's always so creative and it's always quite. Well, Ed, I, I was chatting to Ed Lee about this and he, he was like, it's always quite left field, you know, compared to, because it's such a problem, <laughs> well, you, it's such an issue in snowboarding, Benny, isn't it? You know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, like, right. well, conversation went that way, you know, he's, he's quite the mind, you know, creative mind as well. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean? Like this, this, there's this whole debate, isn't there, especially in like half pipe snowboarding about the, how it is just a rope learn a run and it you know it it can stifle the creativity that's supposed to be inherent in snowboarding and his approach really doesn't do that it seems to unleash that creativity which is and 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 enable enable the riders that he works with to fulfill that that potential which is 
you know, which is why all those riders you've mentioned uh, and your own riding as well, you know, was, was, was everybody liked it so much because, because it, because it, because it, and, and because it is that creativity it is that it's the thing that everybody loves about snowboarding and all these sports, isn't it? You know, this ability to like, yeah, perform, but also do it in an expressive way. And that is totally. getting a little bit lost at points, isn't it? So that, so that, I just think that's why it's really worth saying because it's important isn't it that's yeah it's hands down important and even like um you know years ago when I was um first working with Benny you know he wanted me to uh learn switch backsides instead of like join the frontside 900 kind of um game that the females were in you know whoever did their frontside 900 the biggest and you know usually yeah. won at that point you know it was I mean ex- ex- exactly this yeah yeah this. and and it was it was an interesting to see like because obviously you can't you know just go I'm gonna learn this and you get it straight away you know like I wasn't riding pipe switch you know <laughs> I had to I had to start from the beginning again and work on the fundamentals um yeah. And and I remember Sean White, we were riding and he's just like, Why are you bothering? He's like, just learn a frontside nine hundred like all the other girls. You know, I was like, Why do I wanna do that? Like I wanna I wanna be different. I wanna set myself apart. I don't wanna be a part of that like <laughs> that game, you know. So it was even coming like from within, just going like, Tora, we know you're good, but like just just go show them and do what everybody else is doing. <laughs> yeah. And that, that really came from Benny going like no way like you can be creative and you can use like you know the same pipe in a different way and and he when you talk to him about how you know judging should work and blah 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 you know he's just like you've got frontside backside switch backside (laughs) you know switch frontside frontside alley backside alley he's like use it all (laughs) and so that's what we were trying to do right that's really yeah. interesting. I mean, I, I kind of thought that must be how it had happened, the fact that you did approach it in that way. But it's really, I mean, to be honest, it's just great to hear because that's just what you, that, that's what you want, isn't it? You know, you want, and there, like you say, there are riders now doing it and it's it's really important because otherwise, it you know, I'm not a fan of the whole like, oh, it's gymnastics if you don't have style line. I'm really not a fan of that because obviously I, yeah because it because it, it's it's fucking hard like, let's not forget that and and, and it <laughs> yeah. should it should be it should be respected whatever anybody do but at the same time let's not forget that it's supposed to be about that expressiveness and creativity so that 100 yes. percent. and i think that's why the majority of us like love snowboarding so much because i mean when i i started skiing when i was two years old my whole family did um and we we're from like from a race background and I think when we first tried snowboarding that day, it was like as soon as that board was under our feet, we saw the mountain differently. It wasn't like, you know, get down the mountain as fast as you can with the best technique you could. It was it was literally just exploring the mountain and seeing it differently that captured us. So it really was the, you know, the creative, playful side that snowboarding yeah. let us, uh, you know, play in. And... And you never want to lose that, you know, whether it becomes your career or, you know, weekending it with your friends. It's like it is playful. It is creative. So keep it rolling. Yeah. Well, it's, that's another thing I wanted to ask you about because, you know, I think I first remember seeing you in the mountains personally, maybe 2000, like when I was sort of working at White Lines. And what would you have been then, like 13, 14? 2000s um let's see i think my first trip overseas was 2001 so i was okay. 13, so ra- 13 around that 14. period yeah and you you know you were you were in you you had a profile from such a young age and you were traveling the world and had had expectations on you and you always seemed to handle it really really expertly so I'm just really interested in, in in understanding. Like it felt it felt like, you know, your family, the role models that you had, like your mom, your sister that you've mentioned, 
like that it was it was that a huge part of it, it was that big like that platform that enabled you to i'm sure you you, you know you're laughing i'm sure you're thinking like well, i don't feel like i handled it expertly because <laughs> I, was, I was a 13 year old kid or whatever but you know what i mean they're like from yeah like it, it there's so much so many pitfalls in that path that you took potentially yeah um, <laughs> well i actually look back and think why the fuck did my mum <laughs> send her 13 year old daughter (laughs) off to like frolic the world the snowboard it's like it blows my mind and I I think I I was 14 I I turned 14 when I was um overseas on my first birthday uh, on my 14th birthday (laughs) um but like looking back I was like what a legend too in a way and she she just says she's like yeah well I could taught you correct principles and I just felt that you were smart enough to govern yourself by them. <laughs> and I was like, huh. I was like, you Yeah, still... but what a legend. I mean, that uh, is, that is I know, amazing, right? isn't it? <laughs> um, and, um, but, but I think like at that time too, we were, um, we were so lucky to have friends um, that, that looked after us. You know, Ben and I first went overseas and stayed in Big White with, um, with family friends um, who let us stay with them. And, um, right. you know, so it wasn't like we were just kind of go off, find find your own way, you know. So it was just yeah. the generosity of, of a lot of different people over the years in those young years too that just allowed us to, to do our thing. But I do remember that first year um, I had a uh, – uh, a snowboard shoot with a with an Australian like ski or surf skate snow magazine called Chicks Mag I think it right. was called and um so I went to Whistler for that and oh my gosh I had the best time that I was not gonna leave I was like right. the big white was cool but you know I've, I've I'm in something better right now like I'm I'm not gonna leave so the girls um that I was on the shoot with, they actually had a friend in Whistler that let me sleep on their couch next to their pet lizard. <laughs> so right. 14-year-old Dora just decided that, you know, it was going to be great to stay in Whistler longer. And I slept on Amazing. a couch with some new friends, Beck and Bo. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Amazing. And, um, and then, you know, when, when my welcome ran up on the couch, I went and stayed with another friend, Belinda <laughs> Olding, in her, um, in her little studio apartment. And I did all the local events like border cross and race trained. And I was just riding every single day and I loved it. Um, That's brilliant. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> actually my friend Belinda, like, for some reason, she like looked in my wallet and she's like, what's this? And it was, um, <laughs> now the religious side's going to come in. <laughs> right. And it was a, it was, a, it was a strength for youth pamphlet that was given from, you know, the, the Mormon church, which I was raised, um, in and in it, they were like giggling. It was like guidelines kind of thing. And they're like, they're like, no masturbation. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. That's so, brilliant. you know, mum said, you know, she she trusted us, sent us on our way, but then I had the strength take, for take youth this, card take, in my take, wallet. Take this with you. Put, put that in your wallet. <laughs> she rules for you, eh? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so that was the beginning of our trips. And then that season we actually um, ended up then again with friends in St. Moritz for a couple of weeks before we went on to Junior Worlds in Italy, Zapata. And that right. was our first year traveling. Amazing. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, that's going to set the tone, isn't it? That's going to be, <laughs> I, I, I want to do this. So when when did you hook up with, because, you know, you've been on Roxy for forever, right? You know? Um, yeah. And you've been working with Cersei Wallace for a long time as well, right? So when did when did all that start to kind of come into place? Um, so Roxy, I was, um, I was with Roxy, uh, before that first trip. So, you know, I was 13 and, um, was, you know, a Roxy girl. Um, so yeah, now it's, you know, I'm 33. So it's in 20 years, um, with the company, which is a bit mind blowing. (laughs) Um, and 
I think it, it wasn't until um, the next winter, actually. Um, it must have been 2000 and, 2002 winter that uh, I, I actually went and lived in Mammoth um, for the year and started doing all the local events and, and traveling um, with Roxy to different events um, as well. And it was that winter that um, I, I, you know, I was being told I needed to uh, <laughs> get right. an agent. And so um, Cersei was actually introduced to me through, um, it, I, had a, I had some help in Australia um, and it was that brother that actually worked with Cersei in the US. So um, that's how I got hooked up with Cersei. And to be honest, I think we were like, we loved it because it was another female influence around um, me <laughs> as being a, yeah. a young girl. And, um, you know, with my with my mom not yet traveling with me or anything, it was, um, you know, I think she was a bit relieved as well um, to right. have some kind of guidance as well and a female um, voice, <laughs> you know, yeah. in the space and somebody who'd done it herself. So... Yeah, Cerce so experienced. Yeah, Cersei was just like, and Cersei had actually just had her first baby then too. Um, yeah. Which was um, little Ava. And I remember like going to visit her in California and Ava was like three months old and I feel like I'd never seen such a most, you know, the most beautiful little baby ever. And I was like already clucky for kids then. Right. <laughs> just like took another 20 years. 15-year-old girl, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But um, but yeah, so that's how we that's how we met Cersei. Just after I had some pretty good results that first winter. Like I think, um, I was doing all the Grand Prix, but um, where was it? I got second in the Sims Championships Big Air or whatever it was called, the, the Sims World Championships Big Air. Um, right. Second to Hunter Beeman, and I don't I don't know who came in third, but um. But yeah, I was I was started to get invited into some some pretty cool events too, and I was just like blown away over the moon. I was like, wow, you know. <laughs> started traveling with Roxy and going on different trips, and um, but yeah, it was really that first winter in the states that it all started happening. And um, right, I was I was riding Burton snowboards and and Roxy outerwear, and then it wasn't yeah. too soon after that that I actually chose to go. Um, Head to toe, Roxy. So, right. Yeah. And that the career path that you just kind of outlined was it was it calculated? Did you have a plan? Did you? You know, <laughs> might seem a pretty blunt question, <laughs> but it's just, I think I think it's really interesting for people, especially when you've had such longevity as you've had, and also stuck with like, you know, same sponsors for so long. It seems was it was it something that you mapped out, or did it unfold quite naturally? It. It literally like yeah like I'm I don't even know how to answer I'm like there was there was no planning it was and I feel like it it all came from just the way we were raised to um right uh I feel like or oh, I my parents definitely said you know if you're gonna do something do it well do it great um and I mean the way I clean the kitchen like if I'm going to clean it, I'm going to clean it well, you know, <laughs> like, I feel like it's been instilled in like every part of my life, you know, even if I'm weeding the garden, like right. you know, it's my area, it's, it's weeded, you know, call it perfectionism yeah. or whatever it is. But, but that's how we were kind of raised with, um, within sports and, and everything we did. Um, and, and so I just feel like I was obviously, allowed to take that into snowboarding like obviously a kid doesn't do everything themselves your parents have to be there to get you where you need to be to you know support you financially emotionally you know like <laughs> um ev everything but but that's what it was when it came to the opportunities we were given um with snowboarding that we were just we were allowed to take them and run with them um, right. so, you know, in our local snowboard scene, we, um, we just were there doing all the, all the local events, um, sponsors came, you know, our, uh, yeah, our parents, you know, let us deliver whatever we were asked to do, you know, or be, 
whether it was driving interstate to do different things or um, or going overseas. <laughs> and right. uh, and so, yeah, I really feel it was that, like, it, just that being ingrained into us as kids that we were we were going to take every opportunity we were given and we were going to, like, give it our all. Um, and that's yeah. what I felt like it was that, you know, I was overseas and – and I just did everything I could, took every opportunity I had. And it's it's not like I had any time to, <laughs> to almost feel like I did plan it. I was just like yeah, this little no, that makes sense. frother. That makes sense. I was yeah. just this little girl who frothed on snowboarding and just took the opportunities. And I had freaking incredible parents um, who let me see it all through to see whatever, yeah. you know, potential I had was was every chance was given to making me the best I could be pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Which is incredible. And yeah, you know, I'm working the same industry. I know it works like it. It's not like there's a lot of time to sit down <laughs> when the season's on, is it? You know, it's like, yeah, it's, it is, it is a, it's just on and isn't it, you know, and you're just doing, you know, you're making decisions and, and doing your best really. Like, so yeah. What? So you mentioned you mentioned faith. You know, I hope you don't mind me bringing this up because <laughs> yeah. No, I I started it. I brought it up. <laughs> yeah. You know, you you you. Uh, it's changed, right? Your relationship to your faith. Yeah. And so I, w- was it? I guess my first question is how important when you were younger was it, and then how how has it changed? Um, I would say it was very important to my mother. No kid likes right. going to church, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I remember. Um, I mean, I certainly didn't. Yeah, no, it sucks. I mean, <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> um, and we grew up in a little little country town where there was about five thousand people, and and our family was the only, or oh, maybe two families that you know were part of the Mormon church there. And I think it was like when my mom. This is how she tells the story. When she was, you know, having children, she wanted to, she was searching for something to bring them up in, to give them, you know, good, good morals, good guidance, good, good base, I guess, you know, like religion's great for that. Yeah. Like a code. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so she, she, she said she was, you know, almost going to go Buddhism and then she was an atheist and then, you know, (laughs) then she chose the Mormon church. And she met people through a working relationship, I guess. Um, and so, you know, I was born into it. I think my, my fir- there's five siblings, mind you. I'm second youngest. So I think, yeah. yeah, it was sometime in between the first and the second that she was introduced to, um, you know, the, the LDS church. And, um, and then, yeah, it was just we were, we were raised in it. We were this, like, you know, the weirdos in Kuma. We went to church every Sunday. We weren't allowed to jump on the trampoline. And, you know, we were, right, yeah, it was just we were a bit of an odd family. And it, and it was weird for us as kids too because there weren't other kids at church. It wasn't like right. it was like a big um, congregation. And, you know, my, my dad, he ran it for parts of it. Then, you know, there were missionaries who were sent down from Canberra or Sydney and, um, and they would bring like, you know, old drunks to church. So we'd be sitting next to, <laughs> to, to like these old men who stunk of alcohol. And, you know, <laughs> it was just like right. very, very odd. And, and Benny, man, I remember Benny like hiding down in the car, like below the window and he'd poke his head up and make sure no one, you know, from school or anybody that he knew was around before he would bolt into the church, you know, cause you you do what your parents tell you to do. But um, it wasn't until like kind of much later that, um, you know, some of us chose to to leave earlier, you know, Ben and um, Abby and my oldest brother, Robin, um, they were out like, um, you know, teen, teenage years. And then um, I think like, I don't know, like I was young and traveling the world by myself. And I think I like, in a way, like I liked that there was like a community and something there wherever I was, if I, if I needed help, if I needed something, you know? Um, so I was definitely a part of it and, you know, conditioned to, to want certain things in life. Um, 
but yeah, I definitely, um, yeah, just kind of grew out of it. Um, and I just like, I guess, you know, as you, as you find your different routes of growth in life, it's, um, you, you, things still serve you and others don't. And I think the formal aspect of religion, um, we just left behind, um, <laughs> you know, all of us have now. Um, right. but we're still very much like spiritual, you know, beings. Um, I still pray. I, you know, I don't feel like my, <laughs> my life is, has changed much in a way, you sure. know, I just yeah. don't go to church. I don't, um, you know, have limiting beliefs in those ways. Like I, I question everything. I see that there's a purpose and a place for all of it. And, uh, you know, or, there's no one right religion. And, you know, <laughs> just in this place of, of love and acceptance rather than like, you know, you do this and you, you're going to be in heaven and, you <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess looking back, do you feel that, it sounds like there were some positive things there, like you described, like the the work ethic, the kind of foundation, the you know the the platform you you were given as a, as a kid to sort of achieve success. Um, do you do you look back and think that 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 came from that that relationship to faith, or do you think that that would have perhaps just been the case anyway? Um, it's hard to say, right? Like. It could have played part, but I think it was um, looking back at my mother, you know, and I actually did a, a podcast with her on Mother's Day <laughs> with a local um, group I did. of mothers here. Yeah. And uh, hearing cool. her talk and reminisce about like everything that made her her and how she chose to, you know, parent her children and whatnot, like it really, it really came from a place of growth and giving us our own power. And so, you know, it just so happened that that kind of religious upbringing was part of it. But I, I hands down put it just to my mother's, um, <laughs> what, I, what I don't know what I'd say. She, I call her the white witch because she's right. just like, she's just like, <laughs> like 30 years ahead of her time in, in health and, um, you know, even, even mindset, you know, like she's just like, Sometimes she brings things to me and I'm like, whoa, whoa, mom, I'm not there yet. Like you're, you've got <laughs> right. years on me, you know? And then of course, like sometimes I'm like five years later, I'm like, this is amazing, mom. I wish I had started it five years ago when you told me, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, she's just like, she's just an incredible woman. And what I like love most about her is that like the things that were serving her and, and our family at that time, they, they did, there's no denying it, you know, there's beautiful things um, that came from um, the teachings of religion and whatnot. And you don't, you know, like like anything in life, you, you drop what doesn't work for you, it doesn't serve you, and you keep what does. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what I admire most about her is that she's like, she's constantly on this path of evolution. And um, the old saying where, uh, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, well... Yeah, <laughs> my mother is you know i think she's 70 i think she just turned 70 she's learning new tricks all the time she's like not yeah. stuck in her way she's this in this constant path of evolution and change and you know journey of love and and it's beautiful to watch so um i think yeah with the way we were raised it, you know there were reasons for that and there's lots of beautiful things came out of it but I think the key is, is like just, you know, change and, and allowing yeah. that. She sounds like an inspiring woman. Yeah. She's awesome. <laughs> don't, don't ask her about her children though. She'll, she'll talk your ear off. <laughs> I, might, I, I might try and get her on. You yeah. know what? I, this, it's, it's funny. I've, I've had this idea for a podcast. I, I'm, I should, probably shouldn't say it, but I don't, I don't really believe in people stealing your ideas, but I think a really good idea for a podcast is interviewing people's mums i think yeah. that would be a great podcast like if you if you interviewed celebrities mums and got the real got the real dirt i'd be i think that'd be great yeah that'd be really funny it would be great you'd probably have a lot of profound like teaching and learning moments and then you'd just get some funny shit too
<laughs> I think it'd be good. I, I, I've, I've been, I've had it. I've been sitting on that for a couple of years now. I keep thinking if I could clone myself, I might, I might start that one as well. Yes, um, <laughs> I would. I'd, I'd tap in for sure. Well, you know, they know. Especially you being a mother they? now, soon, you know. Yeah, <laughs> Am exactly. <I> halfway? <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I mean, we've been saying it's it's kind of twenty years really at this point, isn't it? Your career as yeah. as a as a professional snowboarder. Um, was that was marking that what Out of Bounds was about the the film project that you spent some time working on, or was that just more a uh, I want to do something totally different? Well, it's it's funny because I feel like my whole snowboarding career, like once I got to um, the Vancouver Olympics and and won, you know, reached that goal, then it came to Vancouver. I mean, sorry, to Russia, and I was like, man, how am I gonna how am I going to get back to another Olympics and try and best my best and happily, you know? So I feel like I was on this journey of evolution in snowboarding where I just had to, I had to do it differently to make it happy and a good journey for me. So that's where I ended up doing three events in Russia and it was like crazy and silly, but that's how, yeah, that's how I got back there again and happy right. and loved snowboarding more than ever. And so then it really, I think the Out of Bounds film, like, was really what I was longing for, like, all along. Like, I wanted adventure outside of yeah. um, kind of the competitive circuit and all of that because, like, I just, you know, I remember, <laughs> I remember some people just going, what something I said on some TV show where I was just kind of like, yeah, like I love, you know, I, I, what was it? Something about competing. Like, yeah, I don't really like competing. You know, I, I snowboard because I love snowboarding. Competing is just what I was good at or something, <laughs> you know? Right. So I feel like the, the out of bounds, um, project really was what, um, I was looking for something with a little bit of purpose, you know, and snowboarding and adventure telling that story. Um, and it's funny, like I really was like kind of asking for something like that because I was also, um, you know, lots of like endemic films, snowboard films. Like I could have, you know, tapped in and tried to film a, a snowboard part, you know, which I definitely, yeah. you know, <laughs> I was like, oh, that's the only thing I didn't do, you know. <laughs> well, that's um, like the classic, that's the classic thing as well, isn't it, for for competition snowboarders it's always like when you're going to do the part isn't it you know yeah that's... yeah and some some are freaking amazing at doing both but for me i was like i just couldn't i couldn't do both <laughs> yeah in one season but um but yeah the film like it really came at the right time i think um where um yeah i was in the place to give the time needed to to actually film the project and and it was, you know, a little, little left, well, not left field, just like, you know, just it was going to kind of show a show to a bigger audience, you know, and a more, not necessarily a, a, an endemic like audience. It was, you know, if you, uh, you can't watch the film yet, sorry. <laughs> but if yeah. you see it, it's really like, it's, well, it's catered ambitious. towards kids to like, you know, everybody to be able to enjoy it and why why was that important um i think well it's the nature of the imax i guess you know yeah. imax is science based so and it's school groups um and grandparents taking their kids <laughs> pretty much through to imax theaters um uh, generally that's who who goes um and so the films have to have a certain amount of, you know, science to it, uh, and and a and a storyline that, you know, is, I guess, comprehensible to to all. You know, not just like, you know, killer banger snowboard shots one after the other, one after the other. So it really was yeah. like a a more um, informational purpose um, driven film. You know, with stunning yeah. scenery. And you know, has in my been... sorry. Well, I was going to say, has it has it been frustrating that you, people can't see it? Yeah, a little bit because um, 
because of the the current stage of the world, um, we actually did have its first premiere end of October. Um, right. And then we had it, it had started to air like um, in IMAX is a is a funny beast. <laughs> Um, each individual theater picks up the film. So right. r- really it's like we'll be having releases and premieres of the film for the next two years. So LA was meant to premiere it in, um, uh, towards the end of March. And unfortunately right. that was right when like <laughs> everything was going yeah, down. That was, so that one got that canceled. Yeah. Um, but I think it, it was, it's kind of good in a way too, because it, 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 it's just postponed a little bit. It'll still, um, it'll still have its kind of full global, global, um, rollout. Um, but it's just a little bit delayed now and everybody's like, how can I watch it? You know? (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, I, I I mean, I really, really want to see it. Yeah. I was like, well, I can't see right now, you know, no theaters are open. Um, so the the gen the idea behind it is that it'll each theater decides how long it stays. You know, it might stay a week, two weeks, or some theaters will roll it. You know, keep rolling it for two years. Um, so it just depends on the individual theater. Um, but after right. you know it's it's gone out to the IMAXs, it'll it'll come out in different formats. So um, yeah, we'll we'll be celebrating it for years to come. <laughs> yeah. But it was so, like, um, it was amazing because I got to shred with Jeremy Jones and uh, yeah. we also had and a skier to, uh, on board. You got to go to Antarctica as well, which is incredible. Yeah. Yep. So Who's um, the skier? Sorry. Sammy Carlson. Okay. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a legend. So I say like, you know, Jeremy brings like the extreme mountain man. Sammy brings the rad. He's, he's, I mean, he did, he'd be a phenomenal snowboarder if he snowboarded. He, right. he snowboards, uh, yeah. The way he skis is pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and then you know, I'm I'm kind of like the the storyteller, you know, just like along for the ride, you know, learning from these guys, you know. So that's kind of the message behind it, like you know, coming from my competitive background and really wanting to immerse myself in the in the mountains and learn. Um, yeah. So there's like a um, just a, a beautiful message about you know protecting our earth and snowboarding is the storyteller we start off in antarctica and we work our way um up through british columbia or i guess you know the the rockies andes and then um into alaska and we finish up in the arctic refuge um up in the arctic circle and you know looking for polar bears and talking to a um an inupia elder up there so it was like it was quite a beautiful journey to end with, you know, this man wow. who, who uh, you know, lives lives off the land and has this, um, you know, deep kind of connection to the to the earth and the environment and through his native people. So it was um, it was really quite beautiful. Very different to uh, <laughs> any other snowboarding film, but yeah, has a has a good message. Yeah, but like you say there's such a place for that because there's quite a formula for those films that we've all seen a million times so yeah. you know i think that's why i was really looking forward to seeing it because i think whenever you whenever someone just tries to do something different with the form in some way it's it's to be applauded really because it's it's very underexplored i think you know the kind of narrative idea in in our filmmaking you know obviously there there are some which which we, we can probably mention which have been brilliant recently but yeah it's still quite rare so I, you know i think it's it's great yeah. when people try and do something that's a little bit a little bit different take on it you know i'm definitely more drawn to a narrative-based film project you know in yeah in in the snow space as well you know so there's just there's just something like feeling like you're along that journey you know and not just shred porn <laughs> although you yeah. can appreciate well, that too but well it's got it's got its place obviously 100 yeah especially when you <laughs> especially when you, when you like you say when you're a frother and you that's that's what it is for you yeah you know? well but dude it, i used to replay you know certain people's tricks over and over and over just so i could do it like they did <laughs> i was a frother <laughs> yeah i mean same like there's we've all, we've all got those videos haven't we which, yep. which is such a 
rite of passage, you know? Yeah. So so with snowboarding, do you what what are you hoping it'll be it'll look like in the future for you? Yeah. Um to be honest, I'm like, you know what? I'm like, whoa, such a different journey now. Um but still, you know, I've already I've already got, you know, Kimi Fasani ahead of me doing it, yeah. showing it how how it's done, you know? Yeah. So it's not like um you know, I'm the, I'm the only one out there wishing to still continue and, you know, have a family. But I just, I guess what I'm most looking forward to doing is just continuing to share um, that journey as I grow into, you know, motherhood and this next phase. And, and there are so many people out there, like, that are in the same age or phase in life that, like, that want to keep doing the same thing, you know. So for me... Um, I feel like it's a really relatable journey for many people, yeah. you know, <laughs> they just say, why, why should they stop doing the same things? You know, life has to change a little bit, slow down for a little while, <laughs> but, um, yeah, exactly. But yeah, but it really is just like, just sh- continuing to share that journey and the love and the challenges that, you know, <laughs> that come with it and the, the absolute beauty of all the little moments, you know, like, I'm already planning or I keep seeing myself like down in our mountains with my little newborn, you know, strapped to my chest and touring yeah. up, you know, stopping for a little milky break <laughs> and a little yeah. zhuzh down with babe. Um, so it's like, you know, things, things change for a little while and obviously become a little bit more hectic, but I think I'm just like, I'm stoked to just keep, keep, uh, yeah, sharing the beauty of that, of that journey. Yeah, well, it's not long now. What did you say, five weeks? Five weeks, yeah, until my yeah. due date. So, you know, give or take a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, amazing. Hey, well, Tora, thank you so much. That was really that was really great. I really, really enjoyed that. Fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it took us so long. <laughs> ah, that's all right. Let's play, let's play Instagram DMs. I yeah, reckon. yeah. Well, and uh, yeah. I'm I'm super stoked you're happy to push it out because it, it wouldn't have been fun with my um, niece and nephew here. <laughs> I would have had a little <laughs> one-year-old behind here going, ooh, Bubba, Bubba, pointing at my tummy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. Name of the game. So there you go. That was me and Tora Bright, and I hope you enjoyed it. thought it was a lovely, ruminative conversation, that one. Really appreciate Tora taking the time to come on the show. And uh, yeah go in there as we did so although out of bounds isn't out yet there are some trailers and some behind the scenes footage over on youtube and while you're there this is housekeeping corner time you can sign up to my youtube channel and well you're going to find the the select archive and the type 2 stuff i'm also going to put the type 2 live stuff on there just as soon as i get my shit together and i've been saying that every week for a while now so yeah you can get access to youtube look up um my youtube youtube channel sorry by looking at we look um looking sideways sorry god even i'm doing it now calling it we look sideways or in my instagram bio there's a link that says something like subscribe to youtube channel anyway speaking of omnivorous multi-channel social media plate juggling i've been thinking about whether or not to get back onto facebook again it's been a year since i froze my i, th- oh, I might have even deleted it my personal Facebook account and it was because every time I realized every time I went on there I just started to get really aggravated like I could feel my blood pressure rising why well I don't know about your timeline but mine appeared to be full of twats arguing about absolute bollocks the whole time it was bad enough with Brexit so I dread to think what it's like now with everybody chipping in about Covid and the lockdown I mean personally I just don't want the toxic opinion of the Salt Dean Katie Hopkins on 5G vaccinations and all the rest of the absolute shit people talk about on there in my head. And yet, I'm clearly missing a trick if I want to help get more people listening to the podcast. Yeah, that's how much my mental health and morals cost, especially now I've just got myself on YouTube. So what do you reckon? I mean, 
I'll, I'll grant you it's not the best sales pitch in the world and it's hard to believe I actually do work in marketing but you know go and give me a follow over there I've started to use arm's length social media forecasting software to put stuff out but you know go and have a look I mean I, I can't see Joe Rogan having this kind of mental uh, you know inter- interior monologue about Facebook as he trousers his 150 billion dollars whatever it was for moving his whole show and shebang over to Spotify but you know if you've not been incredibly insulted by me saying everyone in there is a twat seek out my page give it a follow and uh and yeah let's see how we get on god I'm not even talking about it I feel like I need a shower so what else has been going on well I've actually been a guest on a few other podcasts recently which has been fun and you know meta I think the phrase is firstly I was a guest on an Australian podcast called Stokely which was very good fun we chatted about how I ended up doing this stuff for a living and um, yeah you know plenty of other themes there's some really good questions in there actually he did call me out on my environmental chops given that I travel so much some really really interesting questions obviously giving it a lot of thought so I enjoyed it I'll share it on my social when it goes live Um, then my friend Tyler asked me to go on his podcast swell season radio as part of a triple slash quadruple header with myself himself and chris and demi from the lockdown surf film festival a bit more of a free form panel discussion that one which was very good fun and not least because i got the chance to go full val and slag off mickey dora which i don't think you can do enough really um and then finally i was a guest on a newly launched podcast called active minds which is about, well, all things mental health and, well, active minds. I think I might have even been the first guest on that one. Very interesting experience chatting about different life and childhood experiences and how they've affected my own personal mental health and sense of well-being, which was, you know, not something I talk about very often, even to close friends of mine. So it's kind of kind of random doing it on a podcast. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. Dave was a great interviewer. and. I think it's going to be a good one, that that podcast. So I'd recommend you have a look when it comes out. It's, like I said, it's not been launched yet. It's called Active Minds. Give it a subscribe. I'll share it on my newsletter when it's out, which you can also sign up to on my um, website, www.wearelookingsideways.com. I'm still, yeah, still doing the newsletter, by the way, every two weeks with the 10 things that I think are worth sharing that week. The alternate week, I still do the 10 things, but I'll put them on Twitter at We Look Sideways instead. Hashtag content and all that. All right, that's it for this episode. I'm back with the next episode of Type 2 in a few days, the podcast that I produce in association with Patagonia, in which I explore the intersection between activism, outdoors and action sports. And my guest is the great Dave Rastovich. I I didn't plan on having two Australian guests consecutively, but that's how it worked out, which is great. Um, Dave was brilliant. Obviously, I was really pleased to get him on. And he was a lovely fella who had a lot of interesting things to say about surfing and climate change and his life in Byron and all the rest of it so I would definitely recommend having listened to that one you can make sure that those episodes land in your preferred supplier by subscribing um, to this podcast and then it'll, it'll you know it'll just arrive on your digital device there we go all right thanks for listening I'll see you next time nice one mm-hmm.